Landscapes, riverscapes, seascapes, and subterranean spaces. From water across land and down beneath the surface of the earth. From invertebrates to fish to mammals, their morphology, physiology, and anatomy. Researchers in botany covered an extensive range of flora, particularly either plants local to the Bristol area or where research into a plant could be used for agricultural purposes. Many of the students chose to focus on species or landscapes local to Bristol, such as botanist Rose Brasher's thesis considering the ecology of the Avon banks at Bristol which made a great contribution to the knowledge of vegetation in this area. Yet their contributions were not limited to university research communities. Many undertook projects working with a range of partners, such as Lily Batten's work with the Ministries of Supply and Health, which had influential findings. There was a strong desire to pass on knowledge and involve others in research about the more-than-human world, such as Frederick Stretton Wallace's work in adult education and work with the Bristol Museum to preserve natural heritage, Rose Brash's student handbooks on ecology, Lily Batten's extensive work on seaweeds, and Leo Palmer's endeavours to record and proliferate speleological knowledge. These students' doctoral theses made important contributions to the knowledge of a variety of landscapes and their species, from water across land and down beneath the surface of the earth. One of the things within that narrative of international and local has been to see the relationship between the local and the global. And for me, it is definitely one that I'm invested in, partly because I'm also part of that more contemporary version of that narrative. It, it's been very interesting to look at how, you know, the researchers uh, traveled from different countries to Bristol or from Bristol and they went for field research elsewhere given that time period and the political context. The international and the local dovetailed in terms of research and context students came to Bristol from near and far. On the one hand, the university welcomed students from abroad at a time of historical significance, raising questions about cultural negotiations both within their research as well as personal lives. On the other, students from Bristol went on to produce research of global importance along with travelling overseas for fieldwork. Welcoming international students meant that research developed was relevant not only within the local communities, but also within global contexts. Indian students at Long Ashton Research Station were in Bristol as a result of imperial links, as well as a concern about colonial development, agriculture and food.
I do see some of my own experience in Olive Griffiths, who was a historian in the early 1930s, completed a PhD in 1933 on religious thought in Britain. After her PhD, she became very interested in widening education and the Workers' Education Movement and the Workers' Education Association and became a local history tutor. She decided to go down a sort of a wider access movement, a sort of widening participation movement. And that, I suppose, really resonates around yeah, how, how I view what we should be doing in academia and what, what we should be trying to do about getting more people from wider backgrounds into these conversations. why did you decide to do this? You know, it must have been such a big step. I mean, it's a big step anyway, but for them especially, it must have been such a massive step, you know, coming away from their uh, homes. So I think these would be my two questions. One is like, why? <laughs> you know, what made you come all the way and uh, come all the way to the UK? And the other would be, how are your experiences different? Or like, how, how is studying here different from studying back at home especially at that time so yeah I'd love to know that <laughs> Bristol's international links were dynamic the connections between the global and local would come to be forged within the space of research as well as within lived realities. Unfamiliar environments governed by strange power structures, new knowledge, continuing barriers and risk could all combine to hinder the researcher. I think it's hard to know what their experiences were but I think there are parts of a postgraduate degree that are universal and even though we only get the kind of final information about the thesis that's been examined we get the final title and the examiners and then it was passed there's always going to be a lot more to it than that and that would not have been the project that they would have started off working on there's always changes of plans, everything everything changes constantly and you have to kind of embrace that change, I think. And I don't see why that would have been any different in the past. For the 12 women, making up 8.3% of the postgraduate researchers in this period, there were specific challenges. Women's abilities could often be derided or ignored by male colleagues. Some, like Mary Carlton and Evelyn Joyce Perrill, researched in pairs for support and their research often went in tandem for this very reason. Others, such as Marion Wiltshire, found female fraternity in university halls. Many women also struggled to convert their research into academic careers. Only four worked long term within academia. Many married academics and assisted in research, but their recognition has tended to be as a wife first and a researcher second. We need to show the stories of the people who have come before us, who are, who were so capable, and so amazing. I had no idea who Lily Batten was, and we've done all the work into her life. Her obituary talks about how she wrote this encyclopedia of seaweeds that was still being used 
50 years after it was originally published and how she did all this work in World War II to do with there's a shortage of agar firm that they needed. That's amazing. We all know about the big scientific discoveries that have happened, but that doesn't mean that there weren't other scientists doing really cool things. International students had to deal with the unfamiliarity of Britain as well as Bristol as an institution. The concentration of Indian students at Long Ashton Research Station may have reflected this difference and students seeking a concentration of fellow researchers. All international students would not be equal in this way though, of course. Some from Australia and New Zealand or South Africa were in their imperial home. Others from India or Egypt would be still within the British Empire but would have been likely to encounter racial prejudice. Perhaps while I might not now feel like I would have to have another woman in the labs with me for my safety as a support um, and a solidarity and having someone that I feel understands, I think it is important that we look at the diversity of research groups, that there, there is that available support network.